have one of the most distinguished political scientists in the United States here to discuss the question of risk, risk-free societies, and that sort of thing, a subject that is of deep interest to all people of libertarian persuasion and all people who are interested in, the, in sorts of questions that libertarians are interested in. So let us welcome Aaron Woldovsky. significant market element that would have been considered unreasonable. There would be some on one side and some on the other, even if there was a preponderance <coughs> market. But that would have been wrong. And the extreme version would have been exactly correct. Sir, can I get you aware of this? Thank you. This can go in your pocket. <laughs> the nearest thing we have to it, isn't it? I suppose that's the way we'll look when Big Brother takes over. <laughs> we in the industrialized Western nations are today not only the richest, but the longest lived and the healthiest people in the history of the world. What we'll do with this longevity and health remains to be seen. But if one wished an association between economic and social life and degree of health, meaning a high mortality and a low morbidity, then one would say that we have chosen the right way. And yet, if you tune in to the public prints, if you read the literature and see what is happening in the public policy of the United States, you get no sense of this because it's all based on the opposite premise. Any day now, I expect to see on the Berkeley campus stretcher bearers carrying away the youth of the nation as they expire from any one of a number of diseases. If you read the newspapers, new disasters from chemical carcinogens, from nuclear weapons, from any aspect of technology are invented daily. Do I kid you? Or will you not find it in today's paper? How then can we explain the extraordinary anomaly where is our health and welfare gets better and better and the news gets worse and worse? Suppose Joe and Paul, famous figures from a Yiddish past, have uh, their groceries on opposite sides of the street, on street corners, and Joe wants to drive Paul out of business. So Joe spreads the rumor, when you eat at Paul's grocery, you get cancer. You think that would be effective? Some of you, I suspect by the name of this convention, have some liking for capitalism, or think that self-regulation through markets is not the worst thing in the world. But according to contemporary mores, you are mean, vicious and killers. How? It is not only indirectly that capitalism kills or that capitalism causes cancer, but if you'll stop to think about it, that you could not justify your beliefs if you thought that the ways of life and economic organization that you so foolishly prefer rot people's insides out, make their fingers drop off, give them cancer, and even worse. To the degree that the argument succeeds that capitalism causes cancer, we will have lost every other argument there is. And the psychology of fear that is diffused through this country. Again, this is not something you heard here as some form of hyperbole. Tune in, read, listen, and you'll hear. It's not made up, it is real. Its purpose is exactly Joe's purpose. To drive out the social and economic system that's 
radical egalitarians don't like in favor of one that they do like. You don't hear arguments much anymore about nationalization. They've given that one up. And you don't hear very much about socialization. And they've given that one up. But the argument over the desirability of self-regulation through markets is not over. It has merely been transferred to a different playing field. Just as heinous deeds have traditionally been committed in the name of liberty, so too the new doctors arrive who only want to improve your health, who can't restrain themselves from protecting your safety. And what have you got to say? I have looked in vain in libertarian literature, in, or in literature by mainstream economists and Hayek and in others, for any sort of argument on the relation between market arrangements and safety. And basically it is zero. The only thing that exists is a very weak argument that if people know something about the dangers, they'll ask for higher wages. And the evidence on that one is indeterminate. When I titled this talk, Risk and Liberty, what I meant was that we are in much greater danger of having our liberties taken from arguments about health and safety than we are from any other argument in our time. Like what? Can you imagine that the American people would submit to having every gas station regulated, every cleaning establishment, every garage fix-up place, virtually any place in this country that has any kind of storage tank, for example. This is called the lust legislation, leaking underground storage tanks. There were millions of them. And we decided in this country as public policy to regulate them without knowing how many there were, what they contained, whether they had leaked out, whether the leaks matter to anybody, whether and to what extent they would do any damage. That they decided to do after the legislation. If we go to the social side of the street, I would say even as late as the 1950s, it would have been unthinkable that the government would intervene in family life so that big people like you would stop beating those little kids. Of course, I see an audience of potential child beaters here, whom it is the task of whole armies of social workers and police to stop from wreaking havoc on small, defenseless, little children who can't fight back. And when we are concerned about the havoc that is being wreaked by AIDS, we also have to be concerned about the havoc that uh, may be wreaked on the victims of AIDS and on what grounds? Public health, of course. If we don't watch it, health is going to make liberty sick. That, in a way, is the policy message that I have. But I decided not to spend the, this time in alarmist talk because you can see it. Listen to the radio, tune in television, watch your newspapers. But rather to spend my time talking with you about how you ought to think about this. That is to say, if we were decent, clean living Americans and we wanted to leave our fellow citizens with better health and safety so they would not only live longer but be healthier at each successive age, as has in fact been true for over a century. What sort of social and economic relations we would have? Let's start out by considering the story known to all of us of the homely potato. And play the poll again. When we were young, our mothers told us quite rightly, that we should eat the rough outside of the potato, the shell, because it had the vitamin. True. But what mother did not know was that everything that has to, that has survived evolution and that wishes to live must protect itself against predators. Plants live by chemical warfare, at least they survive by that. Therefore, potatoes have a considerable amount of poison in them. Now, if you were 
the homely potato, and you had a choice, and you were a libertarian potato, and you were asked, where should we put those poisons? In the rough, dark, dirty bark, or in the nice, white, smooth, pulpy center, where would you put it? The potato can stand as a very important symbol of our rationale here, namely that the good and the bad things in life, that which does us good and that which does us harm, are intertwined exactly in the same objects. Let's suppose this were not true. Then it would be better if we had socialism. Why? Because if the question of health and safety were like this, right? Eve, there is the tree. That's good. There is the other tree that's sick. So there's the healthy tree and the sick tree. Why shouldn't we have a government that would choose the healthy tree? If, on the other hand, the good and the bad in life is inextricably intertwined in the same objects, so that certain safety cannot be plucked from the tree, cannot simply be directly chosen, but must be discovered. And if that safety is part of a larger system with 8th, ninth, and 19th order effects so that many of the consequences of acts are hidden from us directly, then we would need a mechanism that would not make us entirely safe, because that is quite impossible, but would make us safer over time. Don't knock it. If the good and the bad, the healthy and the dangerous, safe and the dangerous were not intertwined in the same objects, you would not need high process of discovery. We could directly choose the good. Suppose we followed American public policy as it is written today in many statutes. And basically that statute says that if a new substance can be shown by test to do some harm, it must not be allowed. Well, what's wrong with this? Are we dealing with the usual moral monster who says, tuberculosis for you, and cancer for you, and decapitation for the other one, somebody wants to kill people, or is there a point to this? The point is that if you follow the rule of what I call trial without error, no trial without prior guarantees against error, you will make us sick. Why would that be so? Let us contrast it, of course, with what we know, with what is the bottom, the basis of market relations, which is trial and error. That is, if you don't know what the world is like and you would like to figure it out, why not pitch in and figure out how it's going to happen? You mean you're going to leave safety to the anarchy of the marketplace? You're going to leave it to these people who are going to run hither and yon and do God knows what? Well, if we had certainty in the world, then of course, again, we could choose. Even if there was statistical uncertainty, or what you would call statistical risk, namely that we didn't know, we knew the kind of thing that was going to happen in the world, you know, consequent upon our acts, but we didn't know the probability of its occurring, then we could say we can figure out what's good in a probabilistic sense. And therefore, we can allow some central authority with its banks of computers and its smart people to figure out in advance what would be dangerous or not. And when we see something is dangerous, we would just stop it. I mean, one mustn't just kill people. You see something is bad for people, stop it. But supposing we don't have certainty, and we don't have statistical uncertainty, but we have something that I, you might call qualitative uncertainty or genuine surprise. By genuine surprise or qualitative uncertainty, I mean we don't, it's not only that we are ignorant of the exact probabilities consequent, say, upon a regulatory act or a market act, but that we don't know the quality of things. We don't know the kinds of things that could occur. For example, possibly the best example of our time, AIDS. Nobody predicts it. Nobody has the foggiest idea that something like AIDS is going to occur. Therefore, we can redraw our initial question, and we might ask, how can we get protection against things, many of which will be bad, and among them will be many things of those bad things that we hadn't the foggiest notion 
would occur at all, let alone what their probability of occurring would be. If we follow the rule of trial without error, that is of stopping things that are known to do something bad, what would we do? First, let's take a couple of examples and then you will see what is at stake. No hospital in the world could remain open. Why? Because of the phenomenon known as iatrogenic disease. You know, hospitals are not good for you. If you've got something real wrong, you might chance it. But if not, hospitals make people sick because there's a lot, you're around a lot of germs, a lot of sick people, and so on. Well, there is a, this is significant and it's a well-studied phenomena. If you're going to say then that we know that people will be made sicker by going to hospitals, does that mean we shut them down? Hell no. What we have come to understand is, by and large, over a larger number of cases in which some people will have the wrong leg amputated and other people will get staph infections and, you know, uh, physicians will leave scissors inside people and all the kinds of stuff that happens with human beings and not only in hospitals. If we were to say that couldn't be done, then all of the benefits that we get from modern tech medical medicine and from hospitals would be negated. Yet, for new substances, that is exactly what public policy now requires. Let me introduce a new name for an old concept here because it helps one think properly. We're aware that of the concept in economics called opportunity cost, that something is worth uh, what you have to give up for it. I've coined a new word term for the same thing called opportunity benefits. Opportunity benefits are what you get from trial and error in the reduction of old and existing dangers. See, when you're thinking about new stuff, you're imagining you've done just as well as you could with the world as it exists. There's nothing dangerous that you want to do anything about. And the question is, are you going to add some danger? So if you are going to say, should I throw myself out of windows or in front of trains every day, then you get the obvious answer that you shouldn't do that. So it seems that there's no possible reply to this. But if you're thinking then that you are undertaking all sorts of new ventures, trying new things, some will do some good. And some will do some bad. And among the good things that will happen is that existing dangers will, in fact, be <coughs> reduced. When you don't have trial and error, when you have trial without error, or no trials without prior guarantees against error, what happens to you is that you can no longer engage in the steady reduction of existing hazards. I pause for a moment. My F student comes to me and says uh, something in funny social sciences, which I will interpret. Should I do a study of a non-existent dependent variable? So I say, no, Johnny. You should not try to explain what never occurs. That's too hard. You should try to find some trend that actually does occur. But what are we doing in the field of risk then? We are trying to explain we're all getting sicker. You show me the trend otherwise. Every accident rate known to man is down. Almost every medical condition has improved, even with cancers. If you control for age, right, if you would allow me. For, given it, I, when my kids were young, I took them down to a place with marvelous beaches, along which are marvelous beaches and a good restaurant called Pescadero, and has a little cemetery. And one thing you learn by looking in that cemetery is whole families are gone in the early 20s and by the early 30s, four, five, six kids and parents, they're all departed at the turn of this century here. Right? So if we see that we're all, that even, that in the old days people lived much shorter and now we live much longer, and even with cancers, you know, there are many different types, when you control for lung cancer, right, for smoking, then almost all, not quite all, go down. And overall, the trend is very good. Why aren't we explaining why we're getting healthier? One reason, and I've tried to say that, of course, if you want to punish corporate capitalism, then you don't want to celebrate its health-giving uh, effects. But besides that, if we spend all our time trying to figure out a non-existent answer to a non-existent question, why are we getting sicker, then we're in danger of giving up the very mechanisms that have uh, helped us achieve 
the unparalleled progress. Indeed, the only country in the world of which it has been alleged that health rates are going down is the Soviet Union. And I say alleged because the, the data that Nick Epistat and others have seems to be pretty good, but of course it comes second and third hand since they're not allowed to go and uh, verify it here. So we ask ourselves a question that's a little bit different here. I've tried to suggest to you that if we follow the trends of policy and say you can't do a new thing unless you can prove it does no harm that we're going to get sicker. And I've given you a hospital example. And another obvious example is inoculations. If you give an inoculation for pertussin, which is whooping cough, some bad things are going to happen to people, which we wouldn't like if it was us. Brain damage, death maybe, paralysis, tiny, tiny proportion. Suppose you don't give it. Then you're going to get several hundred thousand kids get very, very sick. So what should you do? Well, in a way, what is happening here is that all of us are engaged in a great lottery in which we're putting our kids at a tiny, tiny risk in order that everybody else will have a much better chance. But according to the tort laws now, the laws of personal injury, huge settlements come, right? Somebody gets sick, they sue. No, the manufacturer can get no credit for all the lives and sicknesses saved, only damage the other side. The tort law itself has become a form of economic redistribution. There are all these liberal drudges and scribblers, and they're saying, damn, we cannot get economic redistribution to the Congress this year. What are we going to do? Well, every chance we get, we're going to hit the manufacturer. Even economic savants, because they're ignorant of cultural relations, that is, that they're actually people who have ways of life opposed to capitalism and who would like to use any mechanism they can, they don't understand what's happening, so they say, look, you know, when you leave an economist alone with a politician, you're in very, your chances of living, it's very dangerous. So they get in there and they say, well, Mr. Economist, who is it that has the best chance of internalizing the cost, of minimizing cost to society as a whole? They say, the manufacturer. Let's put the cost in the manufacturer. That, that's right. If everybody was agreed this was a capitalist country and that we ought to minimize cost to society, that would be super. But since other people are trying to undermine capitalism, what happens is something like this. You have some idiot speaker here, and he uh, takes that chair, and he puts this speaker stand on that chair. And on that ch speaker stand, he puts a ball. And on that ball, puts a tricycle. And you're a bloody idiot speaker, climbs up on that tricycle, and would you believe it, he falls off and breaks his neck? And what does he do? He sues for a multi-million dollar settlement because the maker of the tricycle should have reasonably foreseen what use would be made of it. Oh, no. Nothing like that will ever happen. You don't know the, case, the wonderful cases we have of the uh, lady who uh, sued for... Uh, getting some venereal disease, not because she didn't invite the fellow home to sleep with her, but because she didn't invite him to do that. Or the even uh, wonderful cases, for instance, I try out cases on people, and I found one that seems to come home to people. And somebody, so I, because I've asked people, what would you say wasn't somebody's fault? They said, well, if you went to the ball game, you got hit by a foul ball. Wrong. Now they get sued all the time. Do carry your gloves with you and don't be a social nuisance at the baseball <laughs> park. The, you see the point here that as we say that we're doing good for people's lives by preventing new things, we are actually harming them because we are not permitting opportunity benefits to go on. A very reasonable hypothesis would be something like this. Consider two classes of events. One we would call low probability, high dangerous event. Say a uh, explosion, a very bad explosion at a nuclear uh, power plant. Or something like happened in India at the Bhopal plant. Vis-a-vis -vis the high probability you'll get a little bit of benefit out of something. That is, by and large, more people's health will be improved than will be diminished by something. A hypothesis that would fit the facts is that if we suffer some low probability, highly dangerous 
episodes. They will be overwhelmed by a very large number of small, incremental good things. Why do I like this hypothesis? Because it actually explains what happens. That is, if it were true, and we'll come to that a bit in a moment here, if it actually were true, then we would understand why over a longer period of time, even though life is full of disasters and many bad things happen, health improves year by year, decade by decade, and so, amazingly enough, does safety, including all the major accidents. Suppose, for example, you do, and finding no literature, and you do uh, very simple comparisons, you take a look at natural disasters, and you rank, you take a look at them that occur in rich countries, rich industrial ones, polluted, disgusting, with every, you know, chemicals entering the body. Just yesterday I heard, when they can't show, you see that big amounts of chemicals will do anything. They have to show then that very trace elements, you know, will make you crazy. What's wrong with this? Well, Bruce Ames, a very distinguished biochemist at our university, has shown now that in your everyday food, uncontaminated by industry or capitalism, plucked from nature itself, the amount of carcinogenic material by weight is over 10,000 times whatever gets into the food chain from pesticides that comes from industry. I didn't say 100, and I didn't say 1,000. It's 10,000 to 1 plus. What this means, these idiot doctors notwithstanding, is the, bo the body is likely to manufacture these chemicals that they are claiming are killing us, that we are much, 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 10,000 times more likely to get them from our peanut butter, our bread, and all the rest of it than we are from industry. Now, of course, if you are standing in front of a pipe that's putting out a noxious fume, I don't recommend it for you. Occupational hazards are different. There, you could get thousands and thousands of times more, and you would want, indeed, to be cautious and careful here. But for the rest, most of these fears are unfound. Look, supposing you drink a glass, needless I say, of uh, Berkeley water. Good left liberal water. <laughs> that has chlorine in it, does it not? Chlorine forms chloroform. Chloroform is a weak carcinogen. Ames has a piece coming out. That's called one, right? Then you go, you've heard, right? Silicon Valley water wells are contaminated. And you read always in the paper, contaminated. With what? How much? That doesn't interest anybody. Or they have a term like they used to use for communist sympathizers, linked to. <laughs> Something has been linked to. Well. You see, water wells doesn't have chlorine, right? And it does have other forms of dirt, carcinogenic material. But the question is, how much, isn't it? Well, it turns out, for all but two of the wells, the amount of carcinogenic material is less than a glass of Berkeley water. Why? Because Berkeley water has more, and that has less. But from reading your papers and what these people say, you get no idea of this at all. So you've learned a little bit that you should ask for comparative data compared to what? Well, here we are trying to figure out how to make ourselves safer and healthier. And we've got the idea that if we continue with trial and error, one thing that's going to help us is the steady improvement in past hazards is likely to overwhelm the few major episodes that we have. Well, wait a minute. Again, this is gross and inexcusable. If you know something bad is coming, and you know it's going to harm people, how can you let it occur? I mean, how unfeeling can another human being be? Let me set up the formula for you. If indeed you are part of a government, and you do know with some probability that bad things are coming, for example, you could take public health measures against them. And I am all in favor of that. Why? Their cost per person is infinitesimally low. The good they do is very large. The cost-benefit ratio is immensely favorable. This, of course, is not what we object to. Remember, 
if you follow the rule of trial without error, you do no cost-benefit analysis at all. You only count the costs the damage to people. You are not allowed to say that ad is, in some way, overwhelmed by this. If you do that, what you're doing is condemning larger numbers of unknown people in society to much worse health. Indeed, one of the great advantages of capitalism over mercantilism or socialism is that individuals are not allowed to say, not me. That is, they're not allowed to set up special protective arrangements for themselves so that all the dangers have to go over as against the other people in society. Back again, you're a good government. And you are well disposed, and you're not dumber than the people here. And you say, OK, we know about some bad things, so I give you rules. If you know with reasonable probability that they are occurring, and you know what to do about them, so that the cure is not worse than the disease. And, a point I'll get to in a moment, the cost is not prohibitive. Come back to that. Then you should do it. That is to say, if indeed you do know enough about the probability of occurrence and what to do about it, at a reasonable cost you should. Why do I say, why do I set up the formula in this way? Because that formula is a guarantee against something else. Have you ever known a nervous person? Have you ever been one yourself? You know, people are always full of foreboding, like Joe Bifstitch in the little, you know, little Abner thing with that little cloud over his head. And you read stuff, bad news is coming. Government can't be like Joe Bifstitch. Government acts. Let's set this up in a conceptual way. Let's say there are two ways to deal with dangers. One is the mode of anticipation, planning. Let's head it off before it occurs. The other is the mode of resilience, a term I've taken from an ecologist named Hollings, bounce back, the ability to learn from failure and damage how to do better. What the ecological literature tells us about animals and insects is that non-human plants, those that do brilliantly in a particular strand, ecological strand, don't do so well when environmental conditions change. But those that don't do so well in one strand often do well over a variety of strands. In the same way then, if you're resilient, you take some punishment, but you learn to bounce back. If you're anticipatory, you attempt to ward off the danger, right? Like the good person should. You see it coming, you stop that speeding car, Nobody gets run over. If you don't guess correctly or predict what's happening, you are going to spend an enormous amount of society's resources trying to ward off dangers that will, in fact, never occur. When we talk about these bad dangers, we're thinking of things that have actually occurred to us. I think it's fair to say from quite exhaustive investigation on my part, and you're, anybody here is welcome to write to me at the political science department at UC Berkeley and tell me if you have other instances here. But basically, I would say that nobody has ever predicted anything important. <laughs> not the airplane, not the computer, not the chip, not feminism, nothing that impacted on my life. False positives mean immense expenditure, right? Because you, many, many possible bad things could happen. You have to guess right a fair bit of the time. If not, what? You know what an immune reaction is like? I suppose some of you do. Uh, we have cases, examples in uh, the literature of the human body, of individuals who are not killed because the organism that invades them is lethal, but because this invasion sets off every defense mechanism they've got, so they kind of die by resource exhaustion, by internal implosion. That's exactly what would happen if we had a prophylactic government. That is to say, if we had a preventative government, a government that tried to avoid our dangers. Again, 
if we reasonably know what's coming, like we could have a cholera or a whooping cough epidemic and so on, it's a damn good idea to do this even if some people get hurt. Provided only one thing, that we don't choose the people who get hurt. It would not be right for a moral human being, certainly not for a libertarian, to say that you or I would be singled out. But if we are taking our chances with the rest of society, it is part of the essential beneficial effects of self-regulatory systems that people are not allowed to shield themselves through protective arrangements which can only be enforced by the government. Here, again, one of the good things about capitalism is we all have to take our chances. If not, not. There's a Salk and Sabine vaccine. One is live, one is dead. If you take one, some, nobody gets hurt, but nobody else gets immunity. If you take the other, some people get hurt, but for reasons we don't have to go into, immunity is conferred on practically everybody. There are some freeloaders in our society, the bastards won't take the vaccine. So that's a harder case, isn't it? Because if we go with the vaccine that confers immunity on practically everyone, we cover the freeloaders. That's a much harder case to cover. But for most cases, what we are talking about here is not singling out somebody for punishment, but saying that every action has some untoward consequences. If not now, then later. That we can't possibly predict. If we're going to say that anybody who gets damaged by something can sue, or better still, stop it, we will stop all progress and we will make health worse. Indeed, the one-hit theory of carcinogenesis, the idea that a single molecule can cause cancer, is the leading edge of our pro-safety people. When you hear that nothing can do any damage, that means that there's no dose response effect. One molecule is enough to kill. In that case, anybody, by claiming damage, can stop anything. Ice minus anything. If you are interested in a technologically vibrant society, if you're interested in a society of change, how could you manage this? My last point here. What is it then that is, in fact, responsible for the increase in health and safety that we have had? What we want is a social mechanism that will interrogate the unknown. That is to say, that will warn us in advance of many of the bad things that will happen, and if they occur, will enable us to respond resiliently. It turns out that that's what markets do. If you think of large numbers of individuals and groups engaging in small transactions, they are crisscrossing society. They won't guess anything if a media collides with the earth. I don't suppose capitalism is going to help us. But for most things, they interrogate large portions of the environment at very low cost. If they fail, they lose. But the rest of us don't lose here. What's back of this? The best I've been able to come up with is this theory here, that the health and safety of society depend on the accumulation of generalizable universal resources. By that I mean wealth, money, information, all those resources from which you can make other things. Not things that you stockpile and you can only good for themselves, but things that are converted into other things. When we have AIDS, for example, the best thing we have going for us is that we had created in the last quarter century before a vibrant biotechnology industry capable of very quickly figuring out what this is about and doing whatever human life will, per, you know, will and knowledge will allow. If this is correct then, we have a different equation. It is not as in cost-benefit analyses, health versus wealth. I never do that. I never let anybody put me in that position. I care about money and you care about life. Bad for me. I do only health, health analyses here. If it is true, and I have immense evidence, that health and wealth are intimately related, every single ethnic group in the world, those in it, health, 
wealthier are healthier. Between countries, wealthier are healthier here. A 1% dip in the unemployment rate has vast effects on health compared to practically anything you can do. There's no doubt about this. If wealth and health are functions of each other, what sense does it make to go through all this regulation, which essentially says, let's make ourselves poorer in a good moral cause so we can be healthier? If, in fact, you would believe the words of the great Sophie Tucker, the red hot mama of my youth, who said, I've been rich and I've been poor, and believe me, richer is better. So I have argued that richer is safer here. What we have is the worst of all the worlds here in that we are being urged to deny our liberties, to give other people rationales for intervention into the most intimate recesses of our lives. For what? To make us healthier. But if we st once we start thinking about it, we see that this is going to make us less free and sicker. And one thing more for San Francisco people here. A friend of mine who talks about these matters from biochemistry says he's going to change his name from Havender, you may know him, to paid industry consultant. Because everywhere he goes, nobody wants to know his argument. They say, who paid you? As if getting pay was a crime. I got news for people who are concerned about the sufferers from AIDS. Can we have two kinds of scientists here? If who pays you determines your science and not the competitive disciplines of science. We don't say science is good because Joe Scientist is a terrific guy. We say it because there's a competitive discipline in science here. If we say that industry, you can't trust anybody from industry because somebody pays you, well, why won't they say the same thing about the medical doctors? The only thing stopping a vast AIDS panic in this country. Listen, just observe. You know what our Berkeley liberals are like. Oh, yes, I love everybody. And as soon as they shake hands, they run into the bathroom to wash. <laughs> Is this theory? No. As John Wayne would say, that's not brag, that's fact, because I've seen it any number of times now. If we weaken respect for communities of scholars and scientists, which is all we got to go on here, on the grounds that they are perverted by corporate capitalism, which causes our cancers, do we think we'll segregate it to one area of our life? I think not. Perhaps you have some questions. Please. Okay. Uh, uh, Jonas Salk has said that uh, the field trials that were done on polio in uh, spring of '54 uh, <clears throat> were implemented through the volunteers of Marshall Dimes. It wouldn't be possible now because of the regulations. Yes. But at that time, there weren't. Uh, he didn't have to uh, ask for any federal permission to do you know, anything. And uh, the program of mass inoculation of school children was enormous. Yes, successful. well, but you, you successful. Um, on the other hand, 22 years later, uh, the federal government uh, tried to implement a mass inoculation program against swine flu and was roundly castigated for it. Um, I'm wondering, is the government now in almost a no-win situation? Yes. Uh, well, the question is, uh, is the government in a no-win situation, beaten if it engages in mass inoculations, and beaten if not? Who here has not seen, in the last week or ten days, articles in the newspaper like this, U.S. economy down the tubes because of trade, def trade deficit, right? Uh, curse those who wish to drill our uh, nation's bottoms, so to speak, off the California coast. Right? Uh, the whole point of this, you see, is to say capitalism is terrible. It makes you sick, and you're not even making money. Uh, and uh, I agree that government is in hard times here. But there is a sadder point here. It is quite, you could have mentioned other cases, for example, where individuals without proper warning and consent have been subject to very bad tests for them. Right? Uh, so. Nobody wants to deny that there is private or public abuse. Of course, there is. What we have to ask is what the effects of regulations will be over large 
numbers of cases here, and I agree with the implications of your remark on the polio testing here, that it is wrong to, tr to say that we can live in a world without any abuse whatsoever. The result of that is the rule of trial without error. Right? If we can't make any mistake, then the only thing, and you're, right, you're, whatever you do is damned, then the government say, well, I didn't do anything. But that is, of course, inaction is also doing something here. So this is an area that people need to know more about. One of its grave difficulties is you have to become experts on too many arcane things. And somebody has you have to read about polio and about things you never heard of. How many here know that the Chernobyl accident is a direct result of, tasting, of testing safety systems? That's pretty good. Most in America, you see what a small proportion that is, do not know this. I mean, it's as if you went, if you went to your car and you put a gasoline bomb under it and lit it, you couldn't have done more to cause an accident than they did. And I have a long screed on the inspection of safe nuclear plants to show you that in testing for safety wreaks tremendous damage. Uh, now, sometimes you should test for safety, but in many times you shouldn't. Why? Because experience and theory will tell you that if you keep testing certain devices, uh, they degrade and the chance of accident increases. All this should tell you is that simply reaching for safety, plucking the right fruit, is not what's necessary. We need as much theory and verification as we can get. We need a lot of trial and error. It's not straightforward. It's crooked and crabbed and indirect. And I think that would be a good description of market relations, wouldn't it? If we knew the theories of how markets worked, why would we need them? Why couldn't we uh, put them on our high-speed uh, machines and direct society that way? The whole point is that we can't e estimate the 19th and 900th order effects. The same is true of safety. I mean, it seems to be a real problem, especially with AIDS. I mean, if you, if you know that you have an infectious disease, um, and then you knowingly... Ah, uh, now that is another you know, matter. Knowingly, I'm not talking about unknowingly. No. Knowingly, don't tell somebody that you're going to sleep That I think you're liable. Yes, but uh, uh, just as I am not the person, you know, who is to rule on moral questions for all of humanity, I could give an answer I'm prepared to give but not the very difficult question that you raised here. There are two ways of looking at it here. In the 19th century, we had such strong, we had overly strong protection of market relations. Let me give, if you went into a factory and you got cut in half, I don't believe either half was going to collect against the boss. Uh, I mean, there was just so stringent. And I've done, one of the chapters in the book I have called Searching for Safety is on the tort law. Now, if we have, you know, uh, if you and I were in a terrible accident, God forbid, and one of us got badly hurt, and we would get X thousands from the other insurance company. If one of us is a city, you get 4X. If you're a corporation, you get 6 to 8X. Well, there are several ways of doing this. One way talked about in Congress is to cut down the si possible size of awards and to have it more like workman's compensation. This may be what we have to do, but I am not too happy with it. Why? Because Lots of people who shouldn't get do get, and some who need a lot, and who get a lot don't get it at all. But no law can be written against interpretation. If you were to read the, the cases that we have cited, and the thousands more that we can't, they're so egregious that as people are reaching, you know, they're all rosy birds, they're reaching out of left field to say that corporate capitalism is guilty as charged. And the whole purpose is to take, is to get deep pockets, right? To take from those who have more and give to those who have less regardless. What I would like is to re, if I could figure out how to do it, is to reinstate the idea of negligence, which is what your original question suggested. If a reasonable person could say with reasonable foresight that you knew about this, then you ought to pay as m all you got or as much as it takes or your insurance or whatever. That's what I would like. My problem is I am not sure 
how to write this into law. Why? I've looked now at uh, internal briefs written by insurance lawyers, and they say something like this. We can't figure out any language to put in the contract that will mean what it says. Why? Because then you see a very creative judge following Justice Brennan's idea. Justice Brennan interprets the Supreme Court the way the State Department lawyers interpret the ABM Treaty. That is to say, uh, he'll take a look at it, and he says, well, in the light of modern conditions, we know who should pay, so let's figure out how to make them do it. That is, it'll say, well, liability stops after seven years. And then you will find a clause in the judge's opinion and will say, but justice requires, and then you're finished. <laughs> so, in a way, I know what I would like. But it's not just a matter of writing a law. It's a question of uh, how, whether you can get juries and judges to go back to what I thought was a medium position here, to, that is to assess negligence in a reasonable way. Tort law is good for libertarians and good for markets because instead of having to guess what will do damage, you can only bring suit after damage has been done. So I'm all for it. But uh, a reading of uh, what has happened is enough to make anybody uh, wonder. So in a way, we know what the, I think I know from a market point of view what the right, and I think from a humane point of view what the right doctrine should be, whether there is any way of writing them in is another matter. Howard, if you are a person who has had multiple sexual partners without appropriate precautions, etc., and you have intercourse with somebody else who then gets a communicable sexual disease, aren't you negligent by the very nature of this, and shouldn't you be uh, subject to um, suit, uh, or, you know, by by uh, by either tort law or negligence law? Yeah. Uh since I want to make sure everybody knows we're talking about hypothetical cases here, or I won't be able to go home. Aren't there any, aren't there any precedents for this? Oh, yes. I think that in my common law understanding of this matter, for instance, will you distinguish between the person who does this and doesn't realize that he's doing something awful, and the person who does this knowing he or she has a communicable disease and still insists upon it. For instance, such a person will say, well, only a certain proportion, you know, get it, and uh, so on. Uh, my own preference would be, which is different than saying what the law says, right, that this should be, negligence and torts are the same, uh, that this should be actionable, okay? Uh, strict liability. But I know, yes, uh, but strict liability doesn't really uh, apply here because it means that even though you made your product well, it could be used in a way that was detrimental to somebody in a way that they are not abusing it. And therefore, you ought to pay, uh, probably. But that's a borderline case. Here, again, the problem is really not with borderline cases. We could resolve the question you are uh, talking about here. Uh, what I know is that the past law will give multiple precedents. If you were talking about a negligence uh, standard, then I believe that person is as negligent as can be, A, about themselves, right? And the first person to protect is oneself, since without that you can't protect others, and then negligent toward others. But what the law would do with it would take a braver person than I. I am more concerned here, not with these individual matters, though I understand they're a burning interest to people who are affected by them, but to the warp and woof of daily life, I cannot think of any other area of endeavor in which people, as they say, from the best of motives, encourage a larger number of detailed interventions into uh, people's life than uh, those who are now the champions of health and safety. Thank you very much for most of this.